It was such a difference from what I'd been flying. It was, it was slower, it was bigger, you know, but so there was something about it. It, it. I don't know what it was, but it, it kind of grew on you. That was one of these kind of aircraft. Uh, uh, eventually, I, I I swore by it. I swore by it completely. Uh, well, not many airplanes that start the war in the front line and finish the war in the front line. And that, that's the swordfish did. Yeah, and a man. have a hell of a job to try and replace it. <laughs> if it hadn't been for the Americans, I don't think they would ever have replaced it. We started off with swordfish. Um, the swordfish had created a very considerable amount of admiration and derision amongst the Americans when, when the swordfish squadron arrived to embark uh, ashore. The uh, Americans all came around and they said, geez, you're still training that sort of thing. We said, he's not training, he's a front line aircraft. They said, you can't go to war in a thing like that. And of course, you couldn't go to war in a thing like that, but we did. Well, I, I think the fact that really they, they were slow and they were lumbering, but they were... A lovely aircraft. You could do anything in them, and the, even if the engine stopped or you got shot up, the thing would still you could still get it down. Um, you know, I think they were just they were a wonderful aircraft. You weren't. I mean, they produced uh, a, a thing. You can probably come across. It's called the Barracuda, and the Barracuda had a terrible reputation. They were death traps. Terrible things. Um, th there was just this great affection for the swordfish because it was it was a wonderful aircraft. It would do anything, um, and Ron used to do anything with it too. I might tell you. <laughs> um, you somehow felt uh, I don't know. You, you, it, it, it's a funny thing. You, you felt you got a friend with the swordfish, <laughs> and I've flown in other aircraft, um, not a lot and didn't like any of them. I did a conversion course onto swordfish. Remarkable conversion course this. They had one uh, dual control swordfish in the Navy. I had ten minutes in this with the pilot. <laughs> went round the run, went round the engine room once in it, he landed. He says, read the handling notes. Get to ten minutes or so, there's a plane, be a plane ready. Good to take it off and fly it around, see what you think about it. Well, I mean, this is incredible to me. After all the preparation for every other type of flying, you see, but the swordfish was just so easy to fly. It's incredible. I mean, to start with, I was shaken at the size of the thing. I hadn't realised how big a swordfish was. The pilot's head is nine feet from the ground, sitting in the cockpit. It had forty-five feet wingspan. Uh, you climbed up the side, up to, to a footstep, two steps in the fuselage, onto the wing, another step into the cockpit. You were up in the air. And when you got in there, you this enormous thing, looking down, and a vast expanse of wings round about you. And uh, when we took off, I mean, he just sort of trudled down the runway for a short while. Before we were, were there, we were, we were flying this aeroplane. And up we went, and round we went. And you had this... Um, <laughs> wonderful open air for you again and uh, I, I like that really because I like the old idea of the helmet and goggles and everything like that, your Irving jacket you know, here we were in a real Biggles aeroplane you know, flying around and as I say, it, t one circuit and then I got up and took the thing off and it just, just so, I felt, well, oh I belong in this aeroplane, it is fantastic it's marvellous, it had the same vintage as the Spitfire, it was, de it was uh, designed and built at the same time as the Spitfire, <laughs> to a different type pattern, but um, it was the one aircraft that started out on the first before the war and was still operating on the last day of the war. And uh, the Swordfish, of course, it sunk more tonnage of enemy shipping than any other Allied aircraft during the whole war, American, British, or anybody else. It just was, it just surely was successful in the jobs it did. And this is the thing, that although I flew other paraplanes, later on I flew Fireflies, uh, if anybody says, what were you during the war, I was a swordfish pilot. And I know other people the same, I've flown three or four different planes, but once they've flown a swordfish, that, that's sort of the hook they hung their hat on sort of thing. Something very special about it. We, we were a bit taken aback when we first sort of uh, 
had a flight in it. After that, we just, we just loved it. We couldn't speak too highly. It's the most tolerant, safe, efficient <coughs> plane ever designed for that type of work. Because you didn't want a, a high-speed monoplane to go looking for submarines. You wanted to chug along, looking all the way around at all. Incredibly reliable. You get a bit of engine trouble, you just sort of say, oh yes, and turn around and come back and still land on with the engine still working. And we had one or two nasty scares when we had water in the petrol. I mean, the engine cut out, but fortunately with two carbur carburetors, <coughs> we managed to turn around and come back. <clears throat> and uh, that happened two or three times. We we had tremendous regard for this fairly primitive design that was so good and so inherently safe that uh, we, we thought they were the best aircraft in the world. It was a remarkably versatile aircraft. Of course, it was, it's been said so many times, uh, how the fleet air arm was starved of aircraft. It was the the poor sister of the RAF, and of course it was only a year before that the Navy had taken control, full control of the fleet air arm in '38. Uh, but the swordfish, we had a great affection for it, and it was a remarkably versatile aircraft. Well, the discomforts of an open cockpit and uh, very cramped conditions, especially for the observers trying to wield a chart board in the back. Otherwise, I don't think we really noticed it. You know, we just accepted it. It had no vices whatsoever, which in a sense made it a dangerous aircraft for anything else you flew later. A swordfish wouldn't spin. If you dived the plane down, yanked the stick back and let it stall, it would just do a stall turn. It would just gracefully slide over like that if you pulled the stick to one side, if you put the rudder to one side. If you didn't touch the rudders, it just drifted down and picked up again. Like that. That's fantastic. Officially, I think it was uh, 60 knots, but you could actually fly it at 55 knots with a fair bit of engine on. In fact, you could even get it down below that if you put enough engine on to hang it up on the propeller. So it was, and as I say, if it did stall, it only fell gently forward, so it wasn't too bad. Fantastic. And you could dive them at about 75 to 80 degrees and as low as you like, pull them out. And they had such a big wing, a lot of um, lift from the wings. You didn't mush at all where a modern aircraft would go in. In fact, during the war, a lot of swordfish pilots were saved when they were attacked by German fighters by diving down and pulling out. And the German would, wouldn't be able to pull out. You'd have to go, to, say, 100 yards above the water. The German would go straight in. But they could pull out, you see. So it had that advantage. Um, it had a lot of give and take in it. So we were always told, if in doubt, if you're going to force a like, crash anywhere, stay in the aeroplane, don't parachute. If you jump out in a parachute, you can easily break your legs. A swordfish is much tougher than you are. You mean, you know, with, with this discomfort and things like that, it co cold and cold weather and this sort of thing, um, no mod cons, uh, difficulty in the, when well, I'm probably flying kit in uh, relieving yourself if on, a long, on a long flight, <laughs> where there was a tube, which was a, if you could possibly get at it, you could use, as long as you avoided the Venturi effect, you got it too close, which could be dangerous. Um, but usually you use the use a flame float, empty flame float can, and use that, and then tip it over the side. Um, but apart from that, that that, that was, was was very very good. And the fact that you had to fly it all the time, you couldn't really, you could relax to some extent, except by sticking your knee against the stick or something, your elbow against the side of the cockpit. But you flew the thing, you flew it all the time, and um, but it was so viceless, and the engine was so good. The Pegasus engine was incredible. It was very slow indeed, and you couldn't get the darn thing down sometimes in a strong wind. But it, it, it wasn't airborne for a very long time, four or five hours, but that was quite enough for the air crew. Uh, my brother, as I said, was flying a Liberator, and nothing less than ten hours. So from that point of view, and doing only that speed, it couldn't cover a lot of areas, but I believe we did that job extremely well. But uh, as I pointed out to my brother, he had a crew of seven. 
and four engines that carried no more armaments than I did in my swordfish with one engine and crew of two. So from that point of view, it was, it was highly e- economical. The endurance, um, well, I'll say with a normal tank, because occasionally we had overload tanks, and, um, it was five hours. And, of course, you, take a, you waste a bit of time taking off and getting away from the convoy, but, but for the usual patrol, it was visible as a distance. And that could go out to about 20 miles. Uh, and you're doing, doing that ahead of the convoy, of course. Although occasionally somebody pops up behind us. Now, reconnaissance at the rear was always a bit hairy because, um, and this is what happened, Gail got up. But with the forecasting, it was a bit dodgy. And they were on a, a rear convoy, a rear a reconnaissance, and the wind got up. And uh, they just couldn't, they couldn't make it back to the convoy. I mean, you've got a 50 knot wind blowing and you can only do about 60 or 70 knots. You, you've got a lot to make up and they just couldn't make Now the convoy would never stop. I mean, it, it's the, the, the captain of the convoy, the commodore of the convoy would say, no, I'm not stopping a convoy just for two, three pictures. And of course they never made it, it just flopped into the sea. Um, and so that was, I mean, you know, there were a lot, our hazards, I think, were far more to do with nature rather than they were with, with the enemy. I mean, theoretically, I think in the handling note, it said a swordfish would fly at 135 knots straight and level. Well, I never went in a swordfish that went over 100 to 120. And operationally, we're using about 75 knots. But uh, a slow-flying aircraft was great low-flying because you could really see things. You could, you could, you could see high-tension cables and get underneath them, if you know what I mean. The swordfish only had an endurance of about four to four and a half hours, but a thing called an overload tank had been developed, which was a great round barrel like a Watney's beer barrel, which was put in the cockpit where the observer used to sit in the swordfish. And as you know, the swordfish had a pilot observer and air gunner, so the observer, poor chap, had to move into the air gunner's position and he had to work the wireless and the rear gun if he wanted it, as well as navigate. But it did, of course, increase the range of the swordfish considerably from about four hours, four and a half to five to about six to six and a half hours. And so this increased the range considerably. And we were the first squadron to be fitted with these long-range tanks. The swordfish, or string bag, as it was affectionately called, being very rugged and having an extremely reliable Pegasus radial engine. The slowness of the string bag, which normally flew at around 85 to 90 knots, that's around 100 miles an hour, was an advantage rather than otherwise, and having open cockpits, It was easy to get out quickly should the need arise, as often it did, and there was an excellent all-round view of the sea. They were armed with depth charges and with four-inch rockets with 28-pound solid armour-piercing heads. The rockets were suspended on racks under the lower wing, four on each side, and fired in pairs, employing a technique of firing in a 20-degree attack dive, aiming for a point short of the surface submarine. On entering the water, the rocket straightened out on a horizontal path below the surface. They were powerful enough to pass right through a submarine, unless they happened to hit the diesel engines. A strike with a rocket meant a certain kill. The depth charges were set to explode at a depth of 50 feet and were intended to attack a submarine which had managed to submerge in time to frustrate a rocket attack. The Swordfish was a wonderful old aircraft, completely without any nasty 
little things and um, although they said it wasn't aerobatic you're not supposed to do aerobatics when you could and you could do a slow roll if, if your wrists were strong enough to get the thing around and you could loop it but uh, the method of attack we were taught was really quite an- antiquated uh, you would climb to about 15,000 feet couldn't go any higher because the oxygen was running out by that time when you never had it on the air was too rarefied and um, you dive down approach dive to about 10,000 feet then stuff the nose down as hard as you can down to 150 feet turn in towards the, the target and uh, run in and drop the torpedo we did that for uh, all about six months as that was all our form of attack then really you see torpedo dropping Uh, we, we started to learn um, to use the primitive radar that the swordfish had uh, and most of the time I was in the, in the uh, A36 squadron it was primitive uh, unreliable very sort of wavy and so on and it helped but of course uh, nothing like as good as it became in a year or two later And we had pretty good navigation equipment, I think. It was called ASV. And we could pick up land and, of course, ships, which was intended, at, at about 25 or 30 miles. So from that point of view, I, I never any doubt about finding my way back to England, for example. And I got a bit nervous out in the middle of the Atlantic because you've got to get within 25 or 30 miles of your ship. And any error in navigation, you weren't going to make it. And we had radar. Um, we started with a very simple form, then towards the end of the war we had this advanced AS3X radar, which was a proper rotating disc underneath the aircraft in a dome, and that gave you actual picture of where you were. And in the later Mark III swordfish, which had the radar dome underneath, you didn't have an air gun, and they lost the air gun, and the observer had his radar in the back there, yes. Mm-hmm. But operationally we weren't allowed to use that near the convoy, in case it gave away the position of the convoy. So you could only use your VHF, your local radio, so you did, it was, you did rely on the observer navigating you back to the convoy. Because although a convoy is fairly big, it's fairly small compared to the size of the Atlantic. The observers had been trained in navigation, and they'd been trained for navigation over water, which meant they were trained to navigate by dead reckoning without use of uh, landmarks. Obviously, they'd use landmarks when they could, but uh, their their main way was getting it over a featureless surface to an accurate position. And they were brilliant, these chaps. I mean, when you think they were standing in an open cockpit in the back, <laughs> in the wind sort of thing, with a chart board and a pencil and uh, a, a few rudimentary instruments, uh, the air gunners were the, the radio control. They were the experts at this. They had um, one Vickers gas-operated uh, machine gun and a scarf mounting in the back, just like the First World War. Uh, we had, and the first and early swordfish, they had a, a, a 303 Browning mounted in, in the bottom of the cockpit, firing forward, but they'd made an awful draft on your legs, and soon, very soon they got rid of that, because no way you were going to be chasing anybody else in a swordfish to fire a machine gun at them. Both the observer and the integrity was cool, because they had to take their gloves off to do the, the working, you see, where you could keep your gloves on flying, except for about all three instruments, but... Uh, Cold was a problem, I must admit. Yes, winter fly was not not jolly, let's put it that way, yes. Uh, but um, it was, as I said, this is how you were. In open cockpit plane, you wore those clothes, sort of thing. And uh, various, it, as you got further into the service, you became more and more unorthodox in what you, what you wore. The aircraft normally had a crew of three, pilot, observer, and TAG that is, telegraphist air gunner. It was the observer's responsibility to navigate the aircraft and get it safely back to the ship. This he did by dead reckoning, measuring the wind speed and direction, and applying changes as necessary. He relied on two magnetic compasses, one on either side of him, with which he constantly checked the accuracy of the aircraft's course, and an accurate clock and stopwatch, keeping on a chart a plot of the aircraft's position 
relative to the ship throughout the flight. Assessment of the wind was made by dropping a smoke float by day or a flame float in darkness, then carefully timing a double 180 degree turn and recording the time the float came into sight on the beam and quarter. With this information, he could calculate the wind very accurately. If the aircraft got lost, there was not much that anyone could do about it, so it was important to get the navigation right. It was his special responsibility to look out for submarines, and to this end he constantly scanned the sea using binoculars as necessary. Anything that might be of interest to the senior officer of the escort was noted, and plotted to be reported on landing, such as individually rooted, rooted vessels with their full description, any lifeboats or wreck, wreckage, icebergs and that sort of thing, and even whales. Whales were often the cause of Aztec false alarms, so it was helpful to the escorts to know they were about and when they could expect to encounter them. Radio silence was usually imposed to avoid advertising the convoy's presence unnecessarily, but a listening watch had to be kept, and the radio transmitter ready for instant use for sending out a first sighting report should enemy contact be made. The radio was the TAG's responsibility, and it was his job to wind out the trailing aerial after takeoff and to make sure that it was wound back in again before landing. The aerial was about 150 feet long, and ended in a number of lead weights the size of grapes. Quite a nasty thing to have clattering down the flight deck if, uh, if it was forgotten on landing. If the winds were light, the TAG had to be left behind sometimes, which meant that the observer had to pick up his duties also. In the interest of weight saving, the twin-mounted Vickers guns, standard for the swordfish, were not carried. I mean, I, I had experience of this of a crash. If you want to know the detail, yeah, this was my. I think this was my. Uh, was it my third one? Yes, this is my third uh, destruction of a British aeroplane. Um, we were flying over on a night exercise uh, on a practice bombing attack uh, over Morecambe Bay. And out in the bay, they had a, a brick conning tower built to represent a submarine. We used to do dummy attacks on this, you see. Well, we were flying on about a thousand feet as we crossed the coastline. And it was a, a starlit night, no moon, but uh, starlit. So you could see vaguely down below you. And the engine just stopped like that chunk. I said, the engine stopped. And my observer said, that's your department, not mine. Well, that was a bit, not very comforting, that, anyway. So I said, well, I'm going to ditch you. I said, I'm not going to risk landing on the shore because round that part of Lancashire, there were a lot of sort of chicken farms and a lot of high-tension cables and things. And I thought, well, I better I could ditch in a few hundred yards from the shore. We can get in the dinghy and get ashore easily, you see. So I could see the water just re reflecting in the... It was smooth, calm, there was no wind or anything in the, in the starlight. So I said to... to um, Dino, my observer, said, lean, lean over, when you get near the ground, let me know, give me an idea how close we are. He said, well, I reckon we got about 300 feet to, and he didn't get the word go out when we hit it. And it wasn't water, it was just wet sand, about an eighth of an inch of water, we totally misjudged the height. Well, we hit the ground with a terrible bump, the wheels came off and went through the wings, <laughs> luckily, and the wings came off, and the body of the aircraft, the three of us, skated along for about 300 yards along the beach. And there was absolute silence except for a whirring sound of the gyro going round and round. And then <laughs> the air gunner started laughing. And Dino started laughing. And I said, and we had hysterics. But for about 10 minutes, we laughed. They killed us. I was laughing. It was so silly sitting in the bottom of this aeroplane on the beach, you see. Well, so that was it. Do you know where they got the name of Sing Bay? was before the war, your mother, or I, I can remember my mother, but, but had this fab thing made of a string. And she went shopping with it. And 
he just she kept just kept popping things in and it got in and it just expanded. It got a string bar because <laughs> because it didn't matter what you put in that swordfish, it could hold it. I'm not kidding. It's uncanny what a swordfish could do. You know, I mean, a seven fifty horsepower engine and uh, three crew and a thousand six hundred pound torpedo underneath. I, it's unbelievable. Uh, they, they, they were, they, they were. To me, they, they were an accident. There must have been an accident the way they were, they were, they were, they were put together, because. Uh, I don't think anybody could have built an aircraft purposely that could do what they... They ended up with, at the back end of the war by putting rockets on them. They strengthened the lower moon planes and put rockets for anti-submarine. And it made a terrific difference in the battle in the North Atlantic. It made a terrific difference. Yeah, oh, yeah. quite uncanny. Anyway, there we are. That's it. Uh... <laughs>